preliminary lectures to next week in slightly more related to the recent development. Uh, so I, I will speak for a systematic and complete introduction to the analysis on the in four lectures. Uh, so instead, I prefer rather to to give it as a sort of uh, introduction to basic notions and basic methods that are used, just to illustrate uh, things that happen in this area. Uh, and of course, there are systematic lectures of this sort. So I know that Gil Kala is giving uh, a long course of lectures here in Berkeley now, uh, which will be covering uh, more or less this area and much, much more. And uh, if you want to, to look for something that is already written down, uh, there is, for, for example, uh, Ryan O'Donnell's uh, blog and uh, book in preparation analysis of Boolean functions. So I would, I would recommend uh, checking there if you, if you want to, to look for more details. Uh, also, I should say that the slides will be made available uh, once the, the lecture, uh, are f lectures are finished. So you don't need to take uh, notes of everything that uh, appears here. Uh, this will be available later on. And well, that's the end of the introduction. So let's let's introduce the basic notation. So by n bracket, I will just uh, denote as usually the set of consecutive integers from one up to n. Uh, by discrete cube, which is sometimes so-called so hypercube, <coughs> will mean uh, just the negative one one in power n, and uh, we'll equip it with a normalized counting measure, uh, which is a probability measure. And this, of course, is a product probability measure. Mm -hmm. We take the measure assigning probabilities one half and one half to both elements of the two elements at negative one, one, and then we just take the product measure, right? So this is the same as normalized counting measure. And if we look at this structure as a, a hard group, uh, just as a compact group with pointwise multiplication, then this will be the same as hard measure um, for this normal structure. Okay. Uh, so Quite many things that I will discuss can be extended in a reasonable way, uh, at least as long as n is finite, uh, to more general probab product probability spaces. And also, quite often, things may be extended either on the cube or on more general product probability spaces, even to the case of infinite products, and sometimes even uncountable products, but uh, I will not go in this direction. Uh, for many reasons, the basic reason is that I want to give a very simple presentation, very elementary presentation, just to make, uh, make those of you who are not very familiar with these notions more acquainted with them, and therefore I don't want to go into technicalities. But most of these things can be extended in various directions. Okay? Uh, so, uh, on the cube, we can also consider the standard Hamming's metric. So the distance between two points, x and y, two vertices, is just the number of coordinates on which uh, these two vertices differ, which is obviously the same as, uh, as the L1 norm normalized by a factor of two. Okay, so this is, again, the standard thing. And given this underlying standard measure on the cube, we obviously have for a real valued function on the cube an expectation, which is just the arithmetic mean of values of f on, in all uh, vertices of the cube. So this is our basic notation. So today's lecture, to the, uh, today's discussions will be mostly related uh, to L2 structure, to, uh, to things that are related to, um, to the uh, scalar product structure that we can introduce on the space of all functions, real valued functions on the cube. So the natural scalar product is obviously defined as follows. We take uh, just the pointwise product of functions and compute expectation. So this is just normalized uh, sum of the products of values of functions in all points of the cube. Uh, 
And also we introduce some other norms, not only second norm, but also pth norm. We just take the expectation of the pth power of the function f <coughs> and take the pth roof. Uh, so we can define this for any positive p. If p is between 0 and 1, usually this will not be a real norm. It will not satisfy the triangle inequality. But if p is greater or equal than 1, then of course you know that this by Minkowski inequality uh, is uh, just a very uh, reasonable norm on the space of all functions. We also consider f infinity, which in our case, because Cn is a finite structure, is just the maximum of the absolute values of functions on all vertices. And these two notations, this scalar product and this notation, coincide in the sense that uh, f2 norm squared is just the norm that is given by this scalar product. Okay. Now, given this scalar product, we can obviously introduce Hilbert space of all real values functions on the discrete cube of size n. And it's clear that because the cube has two in power n vertices, the dimension over reals of this Hilbert space uh, is uh, two in power. Uh, so, now what is the Boolean function? Uh, among all real valued functions on the cube, we can choose some interesting family of functions that take only two values. And both in the case of the discrete cube and in the case of the values that are taken, there are many choices. So, sometimes people uh, would use 0, 1 in power n cube and 0, 1 as values. For most of our proposals, for analytic point of view, it's more convenient, the just formulas get simpler, to take a symmetric cube, negative 1, 1 in power n, and also for the values of the Boolean function, it's more convenient to take negative 1 and 1. Okay, but it's just a matter of aesthetics, obviously by some easy uh, change of notation, uh, one can switch from one, uh, one description to another. I, I will keep to this. Uh, to this way of uh, describing things. So for me, a Boolean function will be a function that takes values negative one and positive one. Okay? And obviously, there are many reasons to study such functions. I, I will just mention a few of them. So one of them is uh, just theoretical computer science, right? Uh, you have an algorithm which takes input of n bits and produces one bit as, as it's out to put, right? So this is the, the very basic thing that, that happens, and you want to analyze such functions to under, understand their structure. Uh, another uh, thing comes from the branch of microeconomy that is called social choice theory. Gil Kalai, for example, uh, made many uh, contributions to this uh, theory. And this can be viewed as sort of voting. So we have n voters which are distinguishable, and each of them is voting either yes or no, negative one, one, and then you want to have some algorithm deciding about the outcome of election between two candidates, negative one and positive one, based on how these n voters actually voted, right? So any such setting saying uh, what is the rule, how to compute from individual voting decisions the general outcome, uh, every such thing will be a Boolean function. And again, you may study uh, different, uh, different properties of such functions, trying to optimize um, some things that economists or sociologists want to optimize in such situations. Right? Uh, so, uh, obviously, voting is just a metaphor, right? Uh, it's not only about voting, but about all sort of decision making in, uh, in microeconomy, whenever you have some binary choice. And <coughs> again, uh, here there are many simplifications in this model. For example, uh, quite often you have more than two outcomes, right? So this is just a first. Uh, first approach uh, to such problems, usually the space of values, possible values, may be like uh, five elements, for example, in many practical problems. But to start with, this is a very natural thing, just uh, modeling uh, such things as a binary choice between two alternatives. Okay, the third natural uh, way to view the Boolean function is combinatorics. 
and we can just view such function as family of subsets of, of the set of integers from 1 up to n. Right? You have some n element set and you consider some family of its subsets. So this can be encoded in the form of a Boolean function. And there is one-to-one -one correspondence, right? Because we have obviously a correspondence between a single subset of this set to the vertex of the cube, right? You just look at the coordinates and you say that coordinates that are negative one <coughs> mean that uh, this, uh, these numbers <coughs> fall into the subset and you exclude all the other indices, right? So there is one-to-one -one correspondence between subsets of, of uh, n element set and vertices of the cube and therefore Boolean function just tells you what family of subsets you choose, right? So this is another natural uh, motivation for studying Boolean functions on the, on the discrete cube, just to understand the combinatorics. Okay. So now the very basic example of Boolean function uh, and a very useful one is a Walsh function. So there are two in power n Walsh functions uh, that appeared also in Adam's talk, uh, the, the, the previous talk today, uh, and they were called parity functions there. So I, I will use the name Walsh function uh, because in mathematical community I, I think it's more common. Uh, so given a subset of, uh, of bracket n, uh, we define a function of the discrete cube just by taking the product of all coordinates of the point x which fall into the set s. Okay? So this is just a multilinear function if you want to view the cube as a subset of Rn. Right? You have n-dimensional cube, you can view it in a natural way as a subset of Rn and then this is just a multilinear function or a monomial if you like. And of course, the natural convention is that if S is an, uh, the empty set, then uh, the uh, respective Walsh function is constant equal to 1 on the whole cube. Okay. So now, in literature, quite often the Walsh functions uh, that are in this indexed by the uh, singletons, by the sets co containing only one element, I, they will be quite often described as RIs and they will be called Rademacher sequence or Rademacher variables or in probabilistic language as independent symmetric plus minus one Bernoulli random variables, right? This is yet another way to view the discrete cube that was in fact mentioned in the very beginning. We can view the discrete cube uh, just as a product probability space and then our eyes are nothing else than coordinate projections. So we are reading the mar marginal measures, marginal uh, measures, right? So because this is a product measures, these projections will be independent random variables. Okay, so this is uh, just many ways of uh, seeing the discrete cube and structures related to it. Yet there is yet another approach to the discrete cube you can uh, just view the discrete cube, as I told you before, as a subset of Rn, and just consider the discrete cube as a set of vertices, the set of extreme points of the solid cube. And this approach would come rather from functional analysis from convex geometry, and also this way of uh, viewing the cube had some impact on the development of the theory. Right? So there are many overlapping ways to, to view these things and this is useful to, to somehow keep in mind all, all possible ways to, uh, to view the same thing from different angles. Okay. So now orthonormality that also was discussed by Adam. So we have uh, the following property that expectation of the Walsh functions is equal to zero whenever S is different from the empty set. And of course, if uh, we have the Walsh index by empty set, it's identically one, so the expectation is one. This is trivial, just because, as we have said a moment ago, the Walsh function is the product of independent random variables, right? So expectation of the product of independent random variables is product of expectations. And of course, each of them has expectation zero, right? So the only way to get non-zero expectation is just when the product itself is empty. So this is a trivial observation. Another trivial observation that was already mentioned by Adam 
but I, I will just give uh, more detailed explanation to that, is orthonormality of Walsh functions. So if you take a pointwise product, as just as a function on the cube, of two Walsh functions, Ws and Wt, what you get is the Walsh index by the symmetric difference of the sets S and T. Uh, this is trivial on the example which I give here. You just take, uh, for example, Walsh index by the set 1, 2 and set 2, 3. So when you take the product, you will see that the square of OR2 can be killed just because Rademachers take only values negative 1 and positive 1, right? So the square is identically 1. Okay, so you can see that exactly in the same way all things, all indices that fall both into S and T will be killed. And the indices that don't appear neither here nor here will not, ap will not appear in this index set either. Right? So because of this identity, we see that the scalar product of WS and WT is expectation of this Walsh function. And because we know that this expectation is zero if and only if this set is non-empty, this means that this is just a Kronecker delta. Uh, which means that this is zero if s is different from t and one if s is equal to t. Right? So uh, this means that Walsh functions form an orthonormal system. Uh, and as every orthonormal system in Hilbert space, this means that they are linearly independent. This is a consequence of orthonormality. And we know that our Hilbert space has uh, a dimension 2 in power n. Right, so we have uh, independent uh, independent set of vectors of cardinality two in power n in the Hilbert space of the same dimension. So this means that this is just a basis. Okay, but there is also a more straightforward argument that I want to show you because I think there is some value in uh, in understanding how it works. <coughs> so to prove that Walsh function span the space of all functions, we can proceed in a more direct manner. So it's enough to see that uh, an indicator of a single vertex, function that takes value 1 at a single vertex y and 0 elsewhere, that this function can be expressed as a linear combination of Walsh functions. But this is trivial. You just take the product of 1 plus xy, yy divided by 2. Okay? So if x differs from y at uh, any coordinate, then the uh, one of the terms that you multiply will be zero and the whole product will be zero, right? So this product will be non-zero if and only if x and y match on all coordinates, but then all terms will be one and the product will be equal to one. Okay, so this is a trivial identity. And now you can just multiply everything with everything, getting two in power and summons, and you can easily see that this reads just in this form. Okay? So now every function f obviously can be shown, uh, can be expressed as a linear combination of indicator functions. And because we can expand every indicator function in the way that we have seen here, and we can um, change the order of summation, these are just two finite summation, sum summations, so there is no problem with exchanging the order of, of addition, uh, we <coughs> arrive at this formula, which shows that every function can be expressed uh, in, uh, as a linear combination of all functions, and actually we get already the form of the coefficients, right? Which is nothing unexpected. Uh, I guess all of you have seen such things uh, somewhere during your undergraduate studies. But this is just to remind you how, how these things work and uh, how you can see it more directly on the discrete cube. Okay? So we have proved in more than one way that every function uh, on the discrete cube admits one and only one expansion of this sort. This is called Walsh Fourier expansion and the coefficients that appear here uh, are called Walsh Fourier coefficients. Sometimes it's abbreviated just to the Fourier uh, expansion. Uh, so we, we, have, uh, we have a simple formula allowing us to read the coefficients from the function just by taking scalar product with Walsh functions. And in particular, for every function, uh, we have uh, a nice way to describe what is the coefficient, uh, the Fourier coefficient related to the empty set. This is, by definition, the scalar product with 
uh, Walsh index by the empty set, which is just the constant function one. So this is just expectation. This is a thing that uh, you should remember that expectation of function is encoded in the Fourier coefficients related to the mm. empty set. And the second thing that was mentioned by Adam in his talk is the Plancherel uh, identity, which says that the expectation of the square of f is the sum of squares of all Fourier coefficients. And let me just uh, recall the standard proof of this fact. Uh, this expectation is nothing else than the scalar product of f with itself. We expand f into the Walsh Fourier expansion. Here we do the same, just we denote the summation index differently. Now we use linearity of the scalar product uh, and we interchange the summation order. Okay. And now we know that this scalar product is equal to 1 when s is equal to t and it's equal to 0 otherwise. So that's the end. Right? So this is very standard thing that all of you have seen that harmonic analysis. Okay, so now let me just uh, say in few words something that I will totally skip in, uh, in all my lectures, that this is a very special case of uh, more general theory that is called LCA theory. So people realized, of course, quite long ago that you can do Fourier transform and all sort of harmonic analysis not only on real line or unit circle or integers or negative one one, but more generally on locally compact abelian groups. And there is whole theory, some, some parts of it quite complicated, uh, describing how to do all the stuff, uh, including Fourier transform and, uh, and expansions uh, in different settings. So CN, the discrete cube, is just a very special case of this locally compact uh, abelian group setting. Uh, more interesting from this uh, theoretical point of view uh, perspective, uh, the more interesting thing is Cantor group when n is infinity. And in fact, you can consider either uh, countable infinite product or even in some, in some branches of topology or uh, harmonical <coughs> analysis, people would be interested <coughs> in, taking, in taking this structure uh, with uh, product of uncountably many uh, two-point spaces, right? Still, this will be a compact thing uh, with uh, the standard product uh, topology by Tihon of theorem. And still, you can do analysis on it. Uh, of course, there are some problems with measurability then. And uh, in most settings, you can only consider functions that live on the space that is <coughs> the uncountable product of two-point spaces, but actually the values of this function depend only on countably many coordinates. Right? So this is sort of cheating. Only, only for such functions you can, uh, you can really get measurability and, uh, and do, do real analysis. But still, uh, from topological uh, uh, or functional analytic point of view, considering such spaces is uh, sometimes interesting. They, they can serve as examples uh, in some nice mathematics. But I will completely drop this thing. I, I will not talk about that. I want to keep to the finite dimensional simple setting. This is just to tell you that such things <coughs> exist. Uh, also, from this perspective, it's interesting to note that CN, the, the discrete cube with group uh, structure, when you consider just point-wise, uh, coordinate-wise multiplication as the group uh, action, on this set. From this point of view, and from the LCA point of view, this is a self-dual group, which means that when you apply the Fourier transform twice, the Walsh Fourier transform that uh, we just defined a moment ago, two times, right? You have a function, you read from this function the set of the Fourier coefficients. This is again a function that can be viewed as a function defined on the discrete cube, right? You have two in power n subsets, and we know that we can identify subsets of the bracket n with vertices of the discrete cube. And when we do that, we get a new function that again lives on the discrete cube, so we can take the Fourier transform again, right? Or we can think about how to take the inverse Fourier transform to get our function f back. So when you look at this, you will see that actually uh, this transform applied twice 
returns you something very similar to your function up to some reflection and, uh, and rescaling. And remember that with classical Fourier transform on real line, you also have some constant factor jumping out and, uh, and a reflection problem, right? So this is the general thing uh, in this setting. Uh, and this is, again, just the special case of this LCA theory that I want to Okay. So, yes. Does the LCA framework um, capture uh, Fourier analysis on Gaussian space? Say, or uh, I guess so. It just depends uh, what you call LCA setting, right? Uh, just, just because they start with uh, the structure without any measure underlying it, and then they consider higher measure, right? So if you do it this way then you would need some group action such that uh, the higher measure would be Gaussian measure. So directly I don't see any, uh, anything of this sort, but uh, then you can view the Gaussian space as a sort of limit uh, thing, right? Uh, so in convex geometry, for example, it's quite a common way of seeing the Gaussian space as a projection from high dimensional spheres, right? And on high dimensional spheres, of course, you have action of groups uh, and harm measure and so on. So in proper sense, Gaussian measure can be viewed as a harm measure, as a projection of harm measure at least, right? So of course, the answer is positive if you, if you phrase it properly. But certainly it doesn't have to be finite, it captures uh, the analysis, uh, harmonic analysis on the line. And <coughs> yeah, but the question was about measure, I understand. Yeah. Okay, so. Uh, in general, uh, I mean, the thing was done with respect to the Haar measure, right? But uh, you can use it to deduce uh, things about uh, the spaces uh, with Gaussian measure underlying. That explains? Yeah. I'm not quite sure I understand the, 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 the Gaussian projection part of the Haar measure. Is it's not, not group action. Uh, I don't say that this fits into the setting, but uh, I say that from things that you can do uh, on, even on high dimensional cubes, uh, you can quite often <coughs> reduce the consequences for the Gaussian measures. So uh, quite many statements are in fact deduced for Gaussian space just for proving things in, uh, in the discrete cube. Uh, situation or counter group and then using some sort of central limit theorem uh, just to get the limit statement, right? So, so you can, if you agree to view the real line with uh, Gaussian measure as the limits, uh, as sort of a limit uh, projection of, uh, of the discrete cube, then you can translate many statements about Fourier transform uh, from the cube to the real line with, uh, with Gaussian measure. Right? Whenever you have a function on real line, you can lift it, lift it up to the symmetric enough uh, function on the discrete cube, function depending on the sum of coordinates, for example. And then you can mm, compute different properties, for example, Fourier transform, and, and then you can come back uh, trying to read this in the context of real line with Gaussian mesh. Th that's a quite common perspective. Uh, uh, and another thing, not uh, by the use of this central limit theorem, but some sort of equivalent of central limit theorem in the convex geometry, would be to consider high dimensional spheres. So there is something that is called sometimes Poincare principle, even though uh, actually it comes from the mid 19th century and it was known to physicists before Poincare, uh, that when you take just her measure, the normalized Lebesgue measure on the uh, n-dimensional uh, sphere in just lying canonically uh, in a Euclidean way in Rn, and then you project uh, to first k coordinates when k is fixed, and if you take the radius of the sphere to be square root of n, then in the limit on this projection to first k coordinates will tend to the k-dimensional standard Gaussian measure. Okay, so, uh, and again, uh, because you have uh, higher measure on this, uh, on this sphere, and you can do things there, that are uh, sometimes nicer than what you do, can do on discrete cube, you can deduce things. Uh, yeah. But uh, of course, s high dimensional spheres are not groups, uh, right? Uh, we know that four dimensional 
uh, three-dimensional sphere will come from quaternions, and, and uh, torus uh, S1 will come from complex numbers, right? But higher up, uh, there is no, no group structure, right? So it, it shouldn't be understood this way. OK, so let's come back to the simple things. So uh, how to compute this Walsh Fourier transform? So the naive approach would be if you want to compute it, you do it for each S, for each subset of bracket, and separate it, right? So that naive approach would suggest that one would need more or less quadratic in the data size operations, number of operations, right? Because for each vertex, you need to take into account values of function in all vertices. It's quite clear to see that if you change the value of function at a single vertex, it affects the Fourier coefficients, each of them, right? So, uh, so you really need to use the values in all vertices. And if you do this for sets S one by one, you really would need uh, like two n squared operations, more or less. Uh, however, uh, as I guess most of you know, uh, much less operations are needed. So in fact, uh, like only logarithmic terms must be added. Uh, so if you are able to compute, uh, to somehow pack, if you have enough memory in your computer and enough time to pack the data, to pack the, the function f itself, then usually you will have absolutely no problem with uh, putting in the memory and doing it in reasonable time uh, with uh, Walsh Fourier transfer. Okay, so now how, how to do that? This is a typical divida et impera method. So we divide our n dimensional cube into two subsets, which are just n minus one dimensional facets. Okay, so we have our high dimensional cube, and now we split it into two n minus one dimensional faces. So each of them is a, the discrete cube in dimension n minus one. So assume that you can compute the Walsh Fourier transform of the function restricted to this phase and the Walsh Fourier transform of the function restricted to this phase. Okay? So then this is an easy exercise and I would advise it uh, to all of you who don't see it now, to all uh, those of you who are not experienced with that sort of thing. I, I'm not sure whether there is a single person in the audience who wouldn't know that, but just in case. Uh, so uh, this easy exercise is that you can put together the Walsh Fourier function, the uh, Walsh, uh, Walsh Fourier uh, expansion of this function and Walsh Fourier expansion of this function, and from these two things you get the Walsh Fourier transform of the whole function on the, on the whole cube. And in fact, uh, you need very simple operation, only addition, subtraction, and division by two. So if you want to implement it in computer, this is very trivial. Uh, so now, if we denote by tau n the number of operations needed to compute uh, the Walsh Fourier transform on Cn, then we have is a bound of this sort, right? We split into two faces of lower dimension. And then <coughs> to put them together, we really need some constant times to in power n operations, OK? But then dividing this inequality by two in power n on both sides, we see that the growth of this thing <coughs> is sublinear, so, uh, so we have proved that we don't need uh, many operations to do, right? Okay, so just coming back to the uh, thing that I said here, that you can identify the subsets of uh, bracket n with vertices of the cube, and that this is uh, good to see the discrete cube in many different ways. Let me just give you some other simple homework exercise for those of you who are not completely familiar with all of that. Again, uh, my assumption is that when you make a boot camp, there should also be some class about how to tie your shoelaces. So this is more or less what I'm doing here. So assume that you have two families of subsets, A and B are two families of subsets of bracket n. Some n element set and two families of its subsets. And then we can do something uh, that I will call parity check, sort of. 
So given S, that is also a, the subset of, uh, of this, uh, we can compute uh, parity this way of the family A in the following way uh, this is just the cardinality of the set of all those uh, subsets from the family A uh, <coughs> that the cardinality of A intersected with S is even and in the same way obviously we find the uh, parity function family B the homework for those of you uh, who don't see it uh, in this moment and I'm sure most of you uh, know the answer is that if for every S parity checks agree then this implies that the family uh, sorry this is A these two families of sets uh, are the same a bit more delicate question that you can ask is assume that th these are not equalities but you know uh, that PSA minus PSB are in some way small whatever this means, you can quantify it somehow. Deduce from it that the A symmetric difference with B more or less right, found it. Right. This may be a bit simpler. This is again curl A. Uh, this is a bit simpler if you assume notation is just a bit simpler if you assume additionally that these two families of subsets are the of the same size mm, expression B ISO okay and in fact you can express exactly cardinality of this symmetric difference uh, as a function of these differences right so most of you probably see in the second uh, how to do that those who don't see think about it uh, this is a good exercise about understanding how how the discrete cube uh, interpretation in terms of subsets uh, works. Okay, and of course this is altogether not trivial if you ask this question in different ways. For example, you can now ask, and what if I restrict not to all S's, but only to some family of subsets? What can I then say about uh, what I can read about the families A and B? Right. And but then it becomes much, much more complicated. This is just to tell you that this is the easy beginning of, uh, of things that, that are not that easy after all. Okay, so now let's proceed. Uh, now let me introduce another uh, very familiar object that uh, I'm sure some of most of you have seen before. So we'll consider a discrete symmetric random walk on the cube. So this is yet another thing uh, that we can do to the poor cube. We can see it as a graph, right? We, um, this is the graph that has two in power n vertices, uh, and uh, it has n times two in power n edges between vertices, right? We say that the edge is when the two vertices are neighboring, which means that two vertices are neighboring if and only if they differ on exactly one coordinate. Okay. Uh, and now we can consider a Markov chain, uh, a random walk on this graph. So for the simplicity, we'll start with the random walk which begins in the point one, 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 one. One. So we start at this vertex at the time t equal to zero. The time is discrete. The time changes every second. Uh, it's discrete and takes only positive uh, non-negative integer values. And wh what we do is we jump 
from the vertex at which we are at a given moment <coughs> to one of its neighbors, and each neighbor is selected with probability 1 over n. Okay? And we do that independently of what happened in the past of our work, right? So, uh, or more strictly speaking, we do a Markov chain with this transition matrix. Okay. So this is exactly what I wrote here, right? Uh, y t uh, describes our position at time t. So at time zero, we are in this vertex. And then the probability, the transition probability from uh, y to x uh, is 1 over n whenever uh, these are neighbors, the, their humming distance. Okay. Uh, now, uh, given this position, uh, random variable yt, uh, we can also get a density, uh, probability density, ft of x, is just the probability that at time t we are in point x. This will be our way to describe these things. And obviously at point zero, at the moment zero, our function is just this product, right? If n of x i is negative one, if the point x isn't at this point, then the product is equal to zero. Other, uh, just in this vertex, we get one, right? So this is just indicator of, of this point. And that's good, because this is how we want to start. And again, we know how to expand this into the uh, arithmetic uh, mean of all Walsh functions. So this is our starting point. And now, obviously, because of our Markov, uh, Markov chain rule, the transition rule, uh, we can compute f in time t plus 1 just from ft by a very simple formula. We take the probabilities of being in all neighboring vertices at time t, and their arithmetic mean will be the probability that in time t plus 1 will be in, uh, in some vertex x, right? Because th that's the only way we can uh, be at, at time t plus 1 at point x, that in the time t we're in one of the neighboring vertices, right? And this is just the standard uh, total probability formula. Okay, so uh, k is just a linear operator on our Hilbert space, right? It's easy to see that this is linear with respect to the function f and multiplication by scalars, by real scalars. So we can say that ft is k in power t f0, understanding this is just as a power of linear operator. Okay, and now this is a formal definition interesting from the point of view of our Markov chain, but now see how it, this works on particular functions, on our Walsh functions, which are special functions and we want to investigate them closer. So I claim that the Walsh function is ag actually the eigenfunction of this operator, and we can compute its eigenvalue, which will be given by this formula. Why is it so? Just because when we are at point x and we take these neighbors, there will be exactly n minus the cardinality of s neighbors at which the value of, uh, of the Walsh function will be exactly the same, right? Because uh, these coordinates that don't fall into s don't notice whether we change the coordinate or not. And there will be exactly s coordinates in which the sign of the function will be changed, right? We'll have cardinality of s neighbors at which the sign of the function will be exactly opposite to the sign of this Walsh function at point x. Right? Because once we change a coordinate that falls into the set x, the product will change sign. Okay? So the outcome is of this form. So we have proved that the Walsh functions form a eigenfunction basis. Uh, k, by the way, can be easily checked to be a symmetric operator. Uh, so, uh, th this is just orthogonal basis for, uh, for a symmetric operator, that's the standard thing. But what is nice is not only that such uh, eigenfunctions exist, which is the, the general uh, statement about symmetric matrices, symmetric operators, uh, but they are of particularly nice form, right, and this, uh, these Walsh functions. So, somehow, this is another way to view the Walsh functions. Before that, we viewed Walsh functions either 
as a products of uh, independent random variables from probably distinct point of view, or as characters on the on the compact group, if we uh, took the harmonic analysis approach. But here there are just uh, eigenfunctions uh, and nice description of uh, of some Laplacian, some Laplace operator related to this uh, walk on the on the cube. Right. So there are many perspectives that can be taken here. Uh, okay, and. Uh, this is just a technical terminology in the language of harmonic analysis. K would be called a multiplier, just because the way K acts on the functions can be described by understanding how it multiplies the elements of the standard basis WS. Right. So this is a, a standard multiplier operator. Okay. So now we know exactly how K in power T would act on Walsh function, right? <coughs> This is eigenfunction. We know the eigenvalue, so this thing will uh, just be in power t. Uh, sorry, there is a typo here. There should be ws at this point. Is ws missing? And therefore, <coughs> the function ft, which is what happens after time t with our point, right? This is the density of, uh, of our point's presence on the cube after time t. This can be described in the following way, right? Just because we remember that f0 was an arithmetic mean of all Walsh functions, right? So because of linearity of uh, the operator kt, we have this expansion. So we have very explicit formula uh, for the presence of our particle uh, that is moving uh, randomly on the cube, okay? And now notice that these coefficients are strictly less than one, actually bounded away from one, unless S is the empty set, or S is the whole, mm, the whole bracket N, right? The absolute value of this uh, will be always between negative one and, uh, uh, this will be always between negative one and one, so absolute value will be strictly less than one, which means that if we subtract these two terms that don't, uh, don't underlie this principle, the term associated with the empty set and the whole bracket N, then the L infinity norm, uh, the maximum norm, can be bounded by this in power t, right? Just because uh, the Walsh functions are Boolean, they are bounded by one uh, in absolute value. So we have this bound, and this goes exponentially to zero when t goes to infinity, okay? So we have obviously recovered a ba basic fact uh, from the theory of Markov chain. This is some sort of ergodicity, right? In a very special case and with a very particular, very explicit formula. Okay. Uh, now, recall that the Walsh mm, that is uh, related to the empty set is just equal to one everywhere and the Walsh index <coughs> to, uh, by, by the full, full bracket n is what is sometimes called parity function, uh, which is the, just the product of all uh, all Rademachers. So this means that in even times, when we have time 2t, when t is integer, this function will tend, and very quickly, uh, exponentially in t, to this function, which is nothing else than the function that is the equidistributed on all vertices that have the same Mm, parity when you add their coordinates as n and uh, and here it will tend to, to the other group. So the cube is always a bipartite graph. If we color if we color this vertex in black and neighboring vertices in white and neighboring to them in black and so on, we will just split uh, the cube into two disjoint set of the same cardinality, black and one uh, and white, so that the black vertices will all only have white neighbors and white vertices will only have black neighbors. And that's exactly what happens here. So because we started from the black vertex, in even points of time we can only be in black vertices. So the limiting measure will be equidistributed over all black vertices. And in odd points of time, we'll always land up in white vertex, 
and in the end our measure will be equidistributed over the set of wide vertices, right? So this is a very specific uh, case of ergodicity, which is not full ergodicity just because we have this uh, bipartite structure, right, and, uh, and periodicity involved. So this is what I said. Okay, so now we can modify this example a little bit just to prevent this splitting to two, uh, to two sets of vertices, white and black, just to kill, in a way, the bipartite structure on the cube. And this is a very standard uh, thing that uh, I guess most of you uh, heard before about. Uh, this is called a lazy random walk. So we do as before from each vertex, we move with the equal probability to each of the neighboring vertices, but we add some parameter lambda, which is say between zero and one half, and we go to a neighboring ver vertex with probability lambda divided by n. Ah. Set of one over n. So with probability one minus lambda, we stay at the place in which we were in the beginning of, of our move. Okay. Uh, so Sometimes this uh, random walk doesn't move almost at all, especially when lambda is very close to zero, right? This is why it's called lazy random walk. Uh, and now uh, we can also uh, describe this uh, lazy random walk as a modification of our previous discrete time random walk by some non-deterministic time change. So for those of you who are more familiar with, uh, with this sort of approach in probability. But I, I will not go in, in this direction. This is just to say that this is obvious uh, to, to those who know the techniques. And now let's see what happens to our density of presence function in this case. Uh, so again, uh, ft of x is its probability that our process, in, in this case, uh, lazy random walk, is at point <coughs> x at time t. So now the starting point we, we do one more minor modification. We start not from this vertex, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, but now we start from some new vertex, say vertex, maybe this, from vertex V. This is our starting vertex at point zero. We are here, and then we move over the cube according to these rules. So now uh, the difference is that F0, of course, will be slightly different. F0 will be given by this formula. Right? And again, you see that if x differs from v at n coordinate, this term would be zero, and therefore the whole product. And the only x for which this is equal to one, this product is just x equal to v. So f zero is concentrated. This is just an indicator of the of the vertex v from which we start at t equals zero. Okay. And again, multiplying everything, you get this expansion that you have seen before. Okay, so now we see that the, <coughs> the rule of passing from t to t plus 1 is very similar to the one before, but we have a slightly different operator, k lambda, which can be very easily seen to be just a linear combination of the old operator and identity. Right? With probability 1 minus lambda, we don't do anything, so we get identity. And with probability lambda, we do what we did before. Okay? So because we know what are the eigenfunctions and eigenvalues for these, and we know that these are Walsh functions, we can compute easily the eigenvalues uh, for uh, k lambda. And Walsh functions are, again, eigenfunctions of this operator. And as before, we get the density of presence function at time t uh, just by applying this operator of the expansion of F0 that we started with here. So using the multiplier structure of this operator, we arrive at this formula. But now, the difference is that because well, lambda is positive, this term will be the absolute value of this, uh, of this uh, term, will be strictly less than 1 in all cases except S equal to uh, the empty set. Okay. So somehow we killed this special case of S being the bracket N, the, the, the whole N, by uh, introducing this uh, small positive lambda. Okay. 
So now we have the same situation as before, but the convergence is simpler. It doesn't depend on the parity uh, of the time. And uh, we have a uniform and exponentially fast, again, uh, convergence. But of course, the speed of this convergence uh, may be quite slow, uh, even though exponential, if lambda is close to zero. The closer lambda gets to zero, the closer this uh, process resembles uh, the process that we had before. Right? So, so this is the price that we pay for, for this approach. Uh, but anyway, this exponentially fast uh, converges to the constant function 2 in power negative n, right? Because the only thing that will remain when t goes to infinity is thing related to the Walsh indexed by the empty set, which is the constant function, right? So uh, we'll have <coughs> in the limit equal probabilities on uh, everywhere, right? So this, this is the full strength ergodic theorem on the discrete cube, right? And then with a very a uh, precise formula uh, allowing you to control the situation quite well, uh, much better than the, uh, than the usual statements of the ergodic theorem. You have very explicit so formula. So most of the mass is actually not on the lower levels, but on some middle level that can converge even faster, right? So yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course, having this formula, you can, uh, you can do much smarter bounds than what, you, what I just said. And knowing uh, something, uh, something more about uh, about how this function evolve with time. Yeah, uh, th th that's the advantage of this formula that you can actually get much better uh, convergence and not only in terms of uh, uniform but also other sorts of uh, convergence if you like, right? So th 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 this is just to, to keep in the very simple uh, argument setting, but, but you are obviously right, and that's the main advantage of this approach, that you, that you get a full information about evolution of this density function, and therefore you can, con uh, you can control it much better. Okay, okay so where does it uh, lead us to? Uh, our, our direction is to see that actually this lazy walk, when lambda is small, close to zero, uh, almost doesn't move, right? So because of the law of large numbers, it moves only in a lambda fraction of the time moments. And therefore, it's very natural to ask actually what happens not at the time t, but at the time t rescaled by the factor of lambda. That's the natural object, the limiting object that, uh, that you would like to see. And by easy computation, we take this formula and uh, take just linear change of and so on. You see that when lambda goes to zero, you don't get the trivial thing that we started with, just the standard uh, discrete walk on the cube, but you get something else that is described by this formula. Okay? And now we can do this thing not only for the process starting from the vertex v. Now we can randomize the starting point. We can say that we start from the discrete cube and our uh, distribution of, uh, of position in the time zero is, is just some described by some non-negative function f0 and such that uh, these things add up to, uh, to one, which may be read from the uh, empty set Fourier coefficient in the, in the expansion of the function. And we now see that if we have this expansion of our initial distribution, then this rescaled uh, lazy random walk tends, when lambda goes to zero, to such a particular object. And we will see in the future that this is a very canonical thing. But here we first see it uh, limiting as a, uh, uh, appearing as a limiting uh, behavior of the lazy random walk on the cube. Okay. Uh, so, uh, let me just mention one thing, just uh, as in real <coughs> harmonic analysis. It's easy to compute the expectation of function, or the sum of values of function uh, as here, uh, from the Fourier coefficients. You just take the Fourier coefficients related to the empty set in our case. But it's not that easy, given a function f in its Fourier expansion, to check whether it's non-negative. This is just uh, some warning, right? This, in the same uh, sense, when you have uh, a function on real line uh, and you take its uh, full, say, say it's even, 
uh, just to keep uh, so that the for uh, transform is also uh, real valued function. It's not that easy to read uh, whether a function is non-negative or not from its Fourier transform, right? Such functions are called uh, uh, positive definite uh, in proper sense, right? And this is an important class of function, but it's not that easy to, to determine whether a particular given function satisfies this, right? So this is just a, a short warning that it's easy to check that these things are probabilities here, that they add up to one by looking at this Fourier coefficient, but it's not that easy to <coughs> see what, when you have given such a Fourier, wall Fourier expansion, it's not easy to check whether this give, really gives you some good distribution, uh, in particular whether it's non-negative in all points, right? So no, th this is just a warning that not everything is as simple as, as you would uh, seem from this uh, formula. Okay, so now let's, let's look at this thing from yet another perspective, but which will be closely related. So now let's take NT to be the standard Poisson process. So for those of you, I guess most of you heard about standard Poisson process before, but uh, this is the random thing that takes only integer values and it's non-decreasing. So here we have the real line and in the points of time that are just real numbers, at point zero we are at zero, here we take values 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. And the moments of jump are chosen as exponential with parameter 1. And here, the time that is needed for the next jump is again exponential with parameter 1. And, and here again and again. <coughs> and all this jump, uh, all this time uh, distances between consecutive jumps are independent. So this is the probabilistic way to describe the, uh, the Poisson process. Uh, it jumps in random times uh, which are selected according to this rule of exponential times. But now uh, let me just uh, try to uh, convey uh, to, to those of you who are not very familiar with this sort of object, uh, some basic idea that underlies this and shows the connection to the lazy random walk and the uh, thing that we discussed a moment ago. Because things that will uh, show up in a moment may seem a bit mysterious to you uh, if you don't understand this connection. So imagine that instead of the clock that is, uh, that is uh, somehow measuring this exponential uh, exponential time that you need, right? Uh, and the usual way to describe this is that you have some Geiger meter and some radioactive material, right? That, that's the common uh, thing in applied uh, world, uh, how to simulate such things, right? And the moments of ticking of the Geiger counter are exactly the moments in which you increase and the number of the of the uh, of the radioactive incidence there will be just the value of the uh, of the Poisson process. Uh, but now let's take a different perspective. Uh, let's see this uh, Poisson process as a limiting object. So imagine that you have some little dwarf hidden uh, who is tossing uh, a coin, and this coin is very bi very strongly biased. So with probability one minus lambda. Lambda is close to zero. This is the same lambda that we discussed before. With probability one minus lambda, nothing happens. Our dwarf doesn't do anything. But with probability lambda, it kicks some uh, radioactive atom, causing it to split, right, and send the signal to Geiger counter. So if you scale properly the time, just again dividing by lambda, uh, in the limit of such small dwarf acting in our uh, in our cage and simulating the, the splitting of radioactive material, in the limit you will get, the, uh, again, the exponential uh, distribution, right? There will be some geometric distribution that in the limit, uh, after rescaling, will uh, go to exponential ones, right? So th th that's the connection between these two things. Uh, so what we have done, this limit transition is the same a transition that would happen here if we simulated this by the discrete uh, time and uh, the proper time rescaling. That's exactly the same thing. <coughs> okay. But this can be also defined in a more abstract way. And I in fact, this is a not completely trivial uh, mm -hmm. mathematical theorem saying that 
Well, there is a unique up to a distribution uh, integer valued Markov process with independent Poissonian increments, which means that uh, for t greater than s, uh, the difference has the same distribution as n t minus s. So it depends on the, only on the difference between t and s. And this is uh, the Poisson distribution, standard Poisson distribution with parameter t minus s. Okay? But that's the same object as here. Uh, and that's more or less what I said. And now, having this standard Poisson process, we consider another standard object, but maybe a bit less popular, which is called Poisson parity process. So we take this process n of t and forget about everything except its parity. So we take nine, negative 1 in power n of t. So if n is even, this will... Uh, give you the value 1, and otherwise it will uh, give the value negative 1. So m will be negative 1, 1 valued. It will jump between negative 1 and 1, which is exactly what we like, because we want things to happen on the discrete cube, negative 1, 1 in power n in a moment. Okay? So this is what happens. Uh, and now there, there is just a short warning to those of you who are not very familiar with Markov processes. So it's not true that when you have a Markov process and you put a function on it, composite uh, some function, then you get again a Markov process. Such gluing may destroy the Markov property. But in this particular case, this will be a Markov process, just because of the symmetry uh, of the object. The definition of Markov process is that uh, if t1 and t2 are two times and m t2 minus t1 is to be independent of t1? Uh, the, the definition would be that the Markov property is satisfied. So uh, when oh. you condition over the presence, it's the same as conditioning over the, the presence with oh. the past uh, added, more or less. Okay. That, that, that would be my definition, right? So uh, It's not that the increment has to be independent or something. You can model you can model every Markov uh, process in this way, right? But uh, formally, formally, when you have a, a sequence of random variables, let's say with uh, numbers by uh, positive, non-negative indices, when you have a sequence, let's say that the size space is uh, finite for simplicity. Uh, so all of them have values in E. Then I would say that this is uh, Markovian, that this satisfies Markov property, if probability that x in p moment t plus 1 is equal to some fixed uh, value e t minus. Under condition that x t is equal to e t, is the same as probability. No, of course, w one should uh, say what happens when the probability of the event under which you condition is equal to zero, and, and so on. Uh, I don't want to get, but basically, uh, that is what I mean by, mar by the Markov condition. But of course, you can rephrase it in, uh, in other ways. If the, right? mapping is, if the mapping is a bijection, then uh, of Markov process... If it's a bijection, then, then, uh, then obviously uh, it doesn't destroy the Markov property. But this one isn't a bijection. It glues uh, all odd numbers into negative one and all uh, even numbers into positive one, right? So such gluing may destroy the Markov property. In, in fact, in most situations, it does. But this, in this particular, uh, it's easy to check that it doesn't, that uh, the Markov property is preserved due to the symmetry uh, of the objects underlying, more or less. Uh, the, if the transition mechanism that is... Uh, the transition matrix uh, that is hidden in this Markov chain is in a way consistent with the way you glue things, then the Markov property will be preserved. That, that's the case here. Okay. So now we can actually compute the transition uh, probabilities for this uh, Parite Poisson process. Uh, so this is a very simple transition rule uh, given. This is transition from 1 to 1, this is from negative 1 to negative 1, and both of them depend only on difference between time t and s, and are given by this formula. And transition from negative 1 to 1 or 1 to negative 1, changing the, uh, flipping the sign, uh, is given by this formula. Okay? So let's compute this 
probability just to, to show you that this is easy. This is probability that uh, the difference of the uh, Poisson process, the usual Poisson process between time s and t is even, under condition that at point s, at uh, time s, uh, uh, this uh, was even. Okay? But now we know that this increment is independent of, of what happened at the time s. Uh, this is just, uh, this conditioning is uh, therefore uh, just uh, equal to probability that this random variable is even. And this you can compute. This is just uh, the Poisson distribution of the set of even numbers, right? So you express it as a sum. You see that this <coughs> sum is just power series for this <coughs> plus pa power series for this. The n odd terms will cancel out and, and you, you end up with the neat formula for that, okay? And now you obviously get this probability as one minus this probability. They must adapt to one, right? Just because m takes only values uh, negative and positive one. So from that you get this probability. And of course, f for these computations uh, are exactly the same. So I, I skip this part. Okay. Uh, so now I should have said that uh, just because we know what happens about uh, the flips, uh, the, the, the time of jumps for the Poisson process, <coughs> we see that for uh, our process, again, the uh, sign flips of the process M will be uh, separated by independent exponential uh, random variables. Of course, theoretically, it might happen that the pro Poisson process jumps from zero immediately to three, for example. Right? Uh, some constructions allow this sort of, of uh, behavior, but that would happen only with probability zero. Right? So it's negligible uh, from the probabilistic point of view. Right? It happens only with probability zero, such, uh, such strange behavior. So uh, therefore, for our parity process, also the jumps, which are now flips between negative one and one, are separated by independent times in each of them with uh, exponential distribution, okay? Now, just to simplify the formula, we uh, slow the time two times. Uh, we rescale it by a factor of two, just to get rid of these two here. And now, notice that this process is both time and space homogeneous. Uh, it's time homogeneous just because uh, it only takes into account what happens as a difference between T and S, and uh, the transition matrix doesn't depend on anything else. But it's also space homogeneous because it doesn't really see the difference between negative one and positive one. There was this symmetry of the probability transitions. Right? So, so this is a very natural object. This is uh, w what I mainly want to say, that uh, it's not only defined in a very precise way, but also it's a very natural object. And in fact, such an object, a process uh, flipping between one and negative one, which underlies these transition rules, this sort of Markov chain, can be constructed completely out of scratch. You don't need to start with a Poisson process. You don't need to have this limiting object. You can do that immediately just by checking that the chapman kolmogorov equations for these transition probabilities hold. So those of you who learned something about stochastic processes know that if you check the chapman kolmogorov equation that will sh uh, show up in a moment, and they are consistent, uh, <coughs> they are exactly the way in which the consistency is checked, then by the Kolmogorov consistency or so-called extension theorem, there is a stochastic process that is realizing, uh, that is a Markov process with this transition structure. Okay? So, uh, this is just to show you how use a different method to construct this object. So now let's t take three times, u, t, and s. u is the largest time, and s is the earliest time, and t is somewhere in between. So the chapman kolmogorov thing that we need to check is the following, that the probability of going from x to z in time between s and u and because of the time homogeneity, we need only to check the difference of the times. Probability that we go from x to z in time u minus s, so starting in time s and ending at times u at z, should be given by this total probability formula. So we take all intermediate points 
between x and z that we had to pass through at time t. In our case, these are just two points, negative one and positive one. And we want this equation to hold. Otherwise, uh, this is not a good sort of uh, conditional probability, right? This thing should up, add up to, to this thing to, to make any sense, right? We just, uh, this is the total pr probability of going from x to z between time s, s and t, and we split it according to where we happened to be at the time intermediate time t. We call this point y, the time t, and this formula should hold. But it's very easy to verify this formula. <laughs> so if x is equal to z, then we know that this expression <coughs> is given by this formula. And now it's very easy to check. We have two points, negative 1 and 1. So we don't need to, to really take care about whether x is equal to y or different from y in one of the sum, in one of these uh, two expressions. Uh, it will be equal, and in the other it will be different. X is equal to Z, so Y equal negative 1 and Y equal 1 will have two possibilities of being equal or different from these two points. So we put in the probabilities that we know from the previous slide, the ones that we computed, and we immediately see that this is just algebraic identity. And the same is for X equal negative Z. You can do the same simple procedure and you check just that the chapman kolmogorov equations hold. Right? So there's a very, very direct and simple way of checking that this object exists, that it may be realized as a stochastic pro process without referring to the Sandra Poisson process and, and all other stuff. It just depends uh, which approach you prefer. Okay? And now let's talk about the continuous random walk on the CN. So again, we have our discrete structure, our discrete cube. We don't have a Brownian motion on the discrete cube, just because there is no continuity, right? Uh, but as close as we can get to Brownian motion, we will consider some replacement for the Brownian motion, which will be con uh, continuous time random walk. So now our time is indexed by uh, non-negative real numbers instead of positive integers. And now we take the process xt that we just talked about uh, uh, on the previous slide, this flipping between negative 1 and 1 uh, Markov process, and we take it, its independent copies on each of the coordinates separately. So on the first coordinate we flip sign, on the second we flip sign independently of what happens on the first, and, and so on, right? We have n independent sign flipping processes. And now we start our Markov process at some fixed vertex v on the cube. And we define our Markov process x view, which is the process starting at point v at time 0, in this way. We just take the pointwise, uh, the pointwise product of this sequence with the vertex v, with coordinates of the vertex v. Okay? So since all of these processes started at point 1, will indeed start at point V. And now it's easy to see what happens. We have n coordinates, and on each coordinate, we wait exponential one time before there will be a flip of sign. So when will the first change occur? When the minimum of n independent uh, exponential random variables with uh, parameter one, right? That will be the first jump. But what is the minimum of n independent exponential random variables with parameter 1? This is exponential random variable with expectation 1 over n, which most people would denote as having parameter n. Some statisticians uh, denote this parameter as being equal to expectation, so uh, they will say that with parameter 1 over n. Exponential with parameter 1 is safe because it doesn't matter uh, which community you belong to. Uh, so that's why I choose this normalization, right? Uh, so that's exactly what happens. And what happens after that is completely independent from what happened before this first moment of jump, okay? So what happens is actually the standard random walk. You move from your neighbor to each of neighboring, uh, from your vertex to each of the neighboring vertices with equal probability 1 over n at the time given by exponential random variable with parameter uh, 
Well, and over two. In fact, I cheated a little bit. There is this factor two that comes from the rescaling. Uh, you remember that we slowed time uh, by a factor of two. So uh, this I intervenes here. Okay. So you see, that's exactly our discrete walk on the uh, with discrete time with some random change of time. Okay. Uh, that's with probability zero. That's exactly <laughs> the same thing that uh, I told about uh, going from Poisson to parity Poisson, right? This may happen theoretically, but uh, with probability zero, so we don't need to care about it. Okay? So we have this process. This is this continuous time uh, random walk on the discrete cube. And now we can define something that is called semi group. So whenever you have a random walk and a function on the cube, you can make a new function, pt of f. You have some real valued function on the discrete cube. You define a new function, pt of f, in the following way. At the vertex v, you define this function in the following way. You start a random walk, which I just described on the previous slide, at point v. You let it run for time t. You take value of function f at the hitting point, And then you take <coughs> expectation over all possible trajectories, right? Over all, all possible things that could happen. But this is very easy to write it down, right? This is just some of the these transition probabilities from x uh, from v to x at time t over all in vertices x of the cube, right? This is a very direct mm, formula. Uh, so what are the properties of such semigroup? This is obviously linear, right? It depends linearly on the function f. So this is a linear operator. Moreover, if you start with function f that is constant 1, this produces again function that is constant 1. This is obvious, right? You just take expectation of 1 of something, which is, which is just expectation of 1, which is 1. So this is trivial property. And uh, this may be read as the invariance of the underlying uh, measure, but uh, that's a, a bit cheating just because we additionally need uh, the property that this semigroup is symmetric with respect to this uh, uniform measure on the Q. So I, I would prefer not to read this condition in these terms. Later on, I, I will tell a bit more about, uh, about this nuance. Okay. And now another condition. If we start with non-negative function, then of course, here we'll average something that is non-negative. So f being non-negative implies that ptf is non-negative, almost true. Right? And because this is a linear operator, this is actually equivalent to saying that pt preserves the order. If you have pointwise uh, inequality between function f and fg, this translates to a pointwise uh, inequality between their images. Right? You just take the difference and, and uh, use the linearity of pt. Okay? So we have a semigroup that is order preserving, in particular positivity preserving, and it preserves the function one. Okay? And now let's check that it satisfies the semigroup property. Is it really correct to call it a semigroup? So semigroup property is this fact that when you take the composition of operators PT and PS, you should get the operator P with index T plus S. That's the basic property of the semigroup. And also you would like P0 to be identity. So P0 being identity is trivial because at time zero you just don't move in this process. So you stay at the place you were in the beginning. Uh, but this property should be verified. Okay, so let's see. By definition of PT, this is just expectation when you run for time T starting from, uh, when you use this semigroup over the point x, v of t, right? And you take expectation. So we can write it down as we did before, just as a finite sum. Now we can write this thing in terms of conditional probabilities. This is just the usual way we describe such a random walk. Uh, and what we have here is again, by definition of our semigroup expectation, but now we t run for the time s starting from point x. Okay? So now we can also write down this expectation as a sum, as a finite sum. And now we can also change the order of summation, because these are two finite sums. 
or you, you may also use other arguments for that, but that's the simplest argument because these are two finite sums. And after changing the order of summation, you may put together this thing. This is just the transition probability, going from x to y in time s by our process. Okay? But this is already the chapman kolmogorov thing that we verified. So we replace this by pt plus s from v to y, and we end up Right? So this is a very common thing. That's not very particular to this particular uh, random walk on the cube. Right? This is the way from which uh, having a Markov process, you produce a semigroup and verify that it really satisfies the, the semigroup property. Right? No, nothing special about our uh, particular random walk on the, on the particular structure was used here, except perhaps finiteness of the structure to, uh, to interchange the summation. But that, that's technically it. Okay. So now, having a semigroup, which is indexed by this uh, time parameter, uh, and such that when you take a function that is square integrable, this produces another square integrable function, and such that this semigroup preserves positivity and preserves constant, uh, constant function 1, such semigroup will be called Markovian. Okay. I'm treating here a little bit just because w when you really do Markov processes and so on on continuous structures, and there are many other things to take care about. For example, measurability with respect to the space, not only uh, what happens with respect to time parameter. And then, of course, you get into some more technical details. But I will not go there. We, we are interested in things that happen for the cube. Okay? So we have proved actually that our PT defined using continuous time Markov walk on the cube, uh, uh, ran, random walk on the cube, is a Markov semigroup. And now, actually, these two things are strongly related. When we have a uh, Markov semigroup, this is actually related always to some Markov process. So we have seen implication one way. We have seen that when you have a Markov process, you can have a semigroup. But also, once you have a Markov semigroup, you can read a Markov process from it. And I, I will only discuss this in the case of finite uh, state space, because it's trivial. And the idea is very easy. You define the transition probability in the following way. You take in the Cantor function of the single state y, which is uh, the state to which we want to come in time t from x. We want to define this probability. And this is where uh, it's really useful to have a discrete uh, state space, right? Otherwise, uh, having indicators functions would, would not be enough, and uh, we would have to, to deal with more complicated uh, expressions. But on the discrete space, that's all that we need. You take the value of the semigroup on this indicator, and value of it at point x, and that's it. This is how you define QT. Now, there are many questions. The question is, are those supposed transition probabilities non-negative? Do they add up to 1? Actually, they do. Why are they non-negative? They are non-negative simply because this is a positivity-preserving semigroup. And uh, indicator is a non-negative function. So they are non-negative. They add up to 1. Here we use a linearity. Right? When you define Q2, Qt in this way, you just replace the order here. You use the linearity of Qt. And here we have Qt of the indicator of the whole space, the constant function 1. So they add up to 1. At time equals 0, they are trivially the Kronecker deltas as they should be. So all conditions are easy to verify. And finally, using the same definition but replacing the rule of x and y by y and z, we can write the image of the indicator z under the semigroup in this way, such sum. And using this expression, we can very easily verify that qt defined in this way satisfy the chapman kolmogorov equation. But I will not stop on. Uh, you will get the slides. If you cannot do this computation yourself, uh, you, you will find it in the, in the slides file. So, uh, but this is very easy, as you can see, just a few lines. So actually, the only thing that remains is to see that this 
Markov structure that we got, the transition structure, is actually the Markov process that we started with, right? We know how to pass from Markov process to uh, semi-group, and we know how to pass from semi-group to a Markov process. But we don't know whether uh, this is one-to-one -one correspondence, right? We need to know that we come back to the same thing. But this is actually, this is what we need to verify, that when you use this semi-group QT defined this way, you will get the same expression that, uh, that you are supposed to get. But now, because of linearity of both sides, it's enough to verify this equality on indicators. And on indicators, this reduces just to the definition of QT, which ends the proof, right? So somehow, uh, th th this was just a quick reminder, quick uh, repetition of the basic theory how Markov processes relate to semigroups. There was nothing specific uh, in what I described for the cube and random walk on the cube and so on. This is more general scheme, more general pattern about the relation between semigroups and Markov processes. And uh, in general setting, uh, when you want to have probability of transitions from V to A, you just take indicator function of the set A. Uh, right? In finite space, this is uh, just is a consequence of linearity. And uh, in more refined situations, when the continuous <coughs> state space uh, is, to dealt, is to be dealt with, you, you must play with such expressions. Right? This is more complicated. OK, so th I think I will stop here. Uh, I'm already over time a little bit. Uh, and uh, next lecture, we'll start with understanding how this semi-group relates to the semi-group, uh, to the thing that we have seen before as a limit of a discrete uh, random walk after time rescaling. We'll see why this semi-group at all is, under, uh, is of any interest to people. And there are many reasons for that. So thank you. <coughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah.